Great. So welcome everybody. Uh, thanks very much indeed for coming. We really appreciate it. My name is John Wickham. Uh, my job is uh, Dean of the Cathedral, so I have overall responsibility for everything that goes on here uh, and, uh, and the buildings and the whole thing, really, which is uh, a, an enjoyable and occasionally demanding job. Um, uh, and one of the things that uh, we have been doing over the last three or four years in the Cathedral is growing our engagement with the arts, uh, the programming of live events, um, uh, quite a lot of music, of course, but just trying to also bring in some theatre, uh, some dance, uh, and also uh, the visual arts. Um, it's been a desire of mine for quite some time that we should have an artist in residence in the cathedral, because if you know the cathedral space at all, um, you'll know that it's incredibly evocative. We have an extraordinary story built into our space. We have the ruins of the old cathedral um, surviving the bombing of November 1940. And then the new cathedral um, finally consecrated alongside those ruins, consecrated in 1962. Um, and between those two halves of our cathedral, we have both brokenness and, uh, and healing. Uh, crucifixion and resurrection in terms of the Christian narrative, uh, but I think a universal narrative of actually experiencing everything that life or the world can throw at you and then finding a way forward into new life. That's what the building speaks of. Uh, and so to bring somebody in who, who resonates with some of the elements of that story and uh, kind of retells them, reshares them, uh, response to them individually and then to share them uh, with uh, new generations, new audiences as well, hopefully, as with some of those who have actually lived through those times for themselves, is, of course, something which I've absolutely longed for. So, um, so uh, uh, when um, Wendy and Anna came and said, well, we've got this idea, it would be great to do, um, to, do to help uh, get a residency program going in the cathedral, um, that was something which was really very exciting. And then when the conversation led to meeting up with James, that just was kind of like, well, this is great, isn't it? This is kind of everything I might have hoped for. Thank you very much, John. And thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight to really listen to James talking about actually what he's been experiencing of the cathedral and of the city throughout uh, two visits over the summer. Um, one of the things that I wanted to start off with, with, with James, uh, really, to introduce, um, Wendy and I, when thinking about what would be the inaugural um, artist, international artist residency, which we hope will in the future become uh, a, a regular programme here, um, we were thinking about what kind of artist would you bring into a cathedral context. Um, it is a magnificent building. It's a unique building. It's a building that is considered in, in, in international terms to be one of the most important religious and iconic pieces of architecture post-war. But it's not just a building, it's not like an art gallery. There are iconic art galleries, but this isn't an art gallery, this is a building of faith, of spirituality. So we thought it was extremely important that in approaching an artist, we approach an artist who would have sensitivities to the fact that this isn't any old building. It's not just a piece of magnificent architecture, but it is an architecture with purpose. It was built for a purpose. And so we were drawing up lists of artists who we thought, actually, wouldn't it be exciting to bring X, Y, and Z to Coventry? But we kept coming back to the brief, what we thought was a brief of importance to investigate certain qualities of what the purpose of this building was around those bigger issues to do with faith, belief, spirituality, values, connectedness, so on and so forth. And this is how we arrived, really, at James. Because I've worked with James, had the pleasure of working with James over a number of years um, on projects actually in various both music and art gallery and performance art contexts in Britain. And it was the fact that James has, has consistently explored questions around belief, communication and value that Wendy and I thought made him actually extremely appropriate for this inaugural artist residency. And so really I wanted to come to you and say, given that that's what we thought, that you were actually appropriate for that brief, 
Um, actually, because we saw in your work and my experience of your work and having worked with you producing and curating work was around those questions of belief and value. I wondered how you responded to that coming from me, saying that's what I think your work's about. Well, uh, it's quite a difficult question. First, hello, thank you very much for coming. Um, I think I should also say that you and I have worked on existing projects. All the projects that Anna and I have put together, along with Craig Ashley at the Mac, we have made with works that have existed. So this is the first time I have been invited to the UK to make something completely new and to respond to a site in a particular way with a new piece. And this was, of course, very exciting and very flattering and also incredibly intimidating. Mm -hmm. This is not... It's not a white cube that things <coughs> tend to look quite sexy when you place an object in a white cube. There's, there's whole economies around that. Um, it looks good on Instagram and, and things like that. So that's quite something to understand when coming to a space that has the gravitas and the history and the meaning of the Cathedral of Coventry. Uh, cathedrals speak of these sort of narratives of moving from sacrifice into... Um, redemption, etc. This is a space that has lived that. That uh, really, that's quite that's quite incredible. It's not just a, a story. This has been a reality here. So that was obviously a big challenge and something that I felt I could only really begin to understand when I came here. Obviously, when I got the email and we skyped it, it all sounded. I wanted to work with you again uh, and wanted to explore these themes. Um, but it really is a quite something being here and seeing what will work and what doesn't work. Often when I've received uh, invitations, I get a particular idea in my head and I think, that would be great. I haven't gone to the site yet. That's also what I should mention. And then I arrive and just realize just how wrong I was. It's a common feeling I have. And maybe this is a point to mention some of my background. Uh, I think this is what I've, I think one of the things that is interesting is your background. And firstly, I'm a South African. My ancestors probably came from the UK or parts of Western Europe uh, to South Africa. Uh, when we speak about um, sites having meaning, I think land in South Africa is a very charged topic. It's really a very powerful a topic and something that particularly a white South African man like myself has to face and has to look at the use of land, the history of land uh, in a country like that. I should also disclose my background. I never studied art and it's probably what my more conservative critics will say is very obvious. Instead, I read for degrees in religious studies, not theology, but religious studies, looking at religious traditions, how people articulate faith, what do they believe in, how do they make meaning of things, we're meaning-making creatures, um, how did our ancestors try and articulate that meaning. So the religious studies department also at the University of Cape Town was a very interesting um, space because I would have been studying there just after apartheid. And so this was also an encounter with African traditional religion. As a South African uh, growing up in apartheid, there was no chance that I could visit uh, certain African churches, mosques or, or synagogues. It just wasn't part of the, the curriculum. And so this was a very powerful, very eye-opening opportunity for me uh, growing up in uh, so-called post-apartheid South Africa. Uh, there was that, and I studied theatre, uh, an interest in sonography, an interest in how things are staged. I suppose also the, the presentation of text, the presentation of choreography, etc. Um, another element of our culture making, uh, theatre. And with theatre and religious studies, there was nothing I could really do with that. This would be late 90s, South Africa, apart from perhaps getting a job as a tele-evangelist to try and bring those two th thoughts together. There was nothing, so I became a, a waiter, as, as one does. And um, I then got a job in an advertising industry, in, in, that, in an advertising agency, and started writing. And as a way of 
I suppose, dealing with briefs, dealing with sites, dealing with forms of communication. And I slowly started making projects that other people would say, well, that, that could fit into the art world. And art world for me was a very scary place. It was a very insular, uh, incestuous place. And I was uh, both fascinated and quite repulsed by it, to be honest. This is late 90s Cape Town, and I'm sure it was similar uh, throughout history. And I'll just quickly show one sort of work that maybe kind of illustrates... What we're going to do is we're going to have a kind of conversation, but interspersed with, with um, uh, illustrations of this work. I, I'd like to, as a kind of a confession, uh, present you the very first artwork, the very first contemporary artwork I made. And please sort of forgive it and me uh, <laughs> in this moment. This would be late 90s. It was the... I think in... France and Canada, the, these events are called Nuit Blanche, which is a, a name that wouldn't fly in South Africa. These are events where all the galleries in town are, are open, and their vernissage is each gallery. And in the Cape Town version, buses would take people from exhibition to exhibition, and there'd be wine and things like that. I didn't have anything on, um, but I wanted to make some kind of intervention into this situation. Uh, in Cape Town, as I believe it's the same here, and the gallery systems use circular red dots to denote that a work is sold. So if you go to the opening and you buy a work, uh, you'll get a little red dot and stuck next to the work. In Cape Town, we also have green dots indicating that the work is reserved. So you umming and eyeing, but you want to try and reserve that piece, you'll get your green dot, you stick it there. On the buses that took people from space to space, I issued yellow dots, circular yellow dots. I didn't ask permission from the galleries. And these yellow dots, I told people, meant <laughs> like it but can't afford it. The late 90s. Uh, it was, I suppose, in a very sort of grand way. Don't quote me on this, even though this is being recording. It's kind of pre-entered the Facebook like, the little thumbs up. And this allowed the audience members who were on the buses to engage with the artworks. They could then take their little yellow dots, and each person had a bunch of them, and they could stick them next to the, the paintings or the sculptures uh, that they liked. The galleries did not know what on earth was going on. They visually thought their spaces had kind of just broken out with measles or something like that. But so there was an opportunity, and this is where the interest in communication and belief, and belief in terms of not just religious belief, but in terms of uh, value and economics, where the audience member would be given an opportunity to make their mark, to say what they liked. They could also possibly comment on something being too expensive for them, because how do you, apart from writing the word interesting in the visitor's book, how can you really, um, I suppose, leave a mark as to your interest in that work? So this very simple piece was my first engagement in the art world. And I think uh, what you identified as my interest in communication and belief, I think this was a kind of a, a formative experience for me. It was also in a kind of mischievous way. It allowed me, this unknown artist, to exhibit in every single gallery in town without the galleries knowing who on earth I was. Obviously, I was never invited back subsequently. And another piece, I mean, just I suppose to uh, anticipate a conversation on the thought that working in sites, specifically in working in spaces that have this if I could use the term charged materiality, the, the space here, the, the charred cross, the cross of nails, this is what I think we could call a charged materiality. This material that has meaning, there's history, it's got significance to people. Um, working in an environment that has those kind of objects, I, I suppose I try to find or distill ideas down to a point where an audience could project their own feelings and meaning <coughs> onto, onto images. And when I say images, I don't mean just vis visuality. I think an image can be a literary or a sonic thing. It's, it's an idea. Uh, this is a, is a recent project of mine. It's a project that took a long time for me to make because it was so simple that I, I was waiting to give myself permission to make this work. What it essentially is is two loudspeakers. Uh, Here's one of them, slightly stretched on the uh, on screen. S loudspeaker, the cone plucked out of the loudspeaker box, and it's been affixed to, to a wall. And facing it on the other wall is another loudspeaker, 
So these two speakers can see each other uh, if, they, <laughs> if they were sentient, um, but they're facing each other, same height, uh, and they're separated by the dim dimensions of the space. And very simply, in each speaker, there is the sound of a human heartbeat. Two human heartbeats. I don't disclose who I recorded for, for this purpose. But in this moment, in this installation, you can move between each body and listen to that heartbeat. The piece is called All That Is Unknown. I was interested in, I suppose, moving away from words, thinking about experiences that uh, defied words, um, thinking about the mystery between two people, two bodies, these heartbeats that are, are kind of rhythms uh, that keep us alive. Uh, this was also for um, sort of the artists and, and uh, art historians among us. It was, a, I suppose, a, a challenge to the very famous conceptual piece um, untitled Perfect Lovers by Felix Gonzalez Torres, which you might know with these two clocks that are in sync with each other, two kind of hand clocks that tick same uh, speed. And they are there as... Uh, well, according to the artist, to denote and suggest him and his partner being in perfect sync uh, with each other. And I thought, well, that's not my experience of, from partners or any situation with anyone, to be honest. And here you've got these two biological clocks that are out of sync, but like in a kind of um, traditional African music that, uh, that I would know from home, these polyrhythms, these beats that, uh, that are moving between these two bodies, that they, they could be some kind of call and response between two bodies. I mentioned these two works just to give you a, the breadth of my practice, an interest in words, an interest in things being open for an audience to interpret, are these lovers, are these parents, are these strangers? I, it's not my job to tell you, I don't think, in that moment. Uh, do you want to show prayer now? Quick, very quick... Uh, mention of prayer and uh, oh, this I'll jump over but this is a piece I've, I've worked with Craig um, at the Mac uh, and, and yourself a few years ago a, a piece with words in 2005 I speaking of charged materiality I visited the atomic bomb museum of Nagasaki and there had an incredible emotional experience seeing these objects on display, objects that had been transformed not by si some silly conceptual artist, but by an atomic bomb on the 9th of August, um, 1945. These objects that, at first when I saw something, it looked like a, a football that had been collapsed. And only when I found the little note, the, the exhibition card, did it say, steel helmet with the remains of a skull. And so it was through these texts, through the words, that I understood the kind of the magnitude of this experience and I, I suppose projected meaning onto these sort of objects that had been warped and had been transformed, to use an artistic term, uh, but this kind of utter devastation that had occurred on that uh, fateful day. And the very simple project that I undertook was to note down all the text, all the titles of the displays. I think there must be about 75 titles. And collected them and made little cards just with these, just with these words, uh, mushroom cloud photograph from US bomber, um, shadows left by the heat rays. And this became a kind of a, both an inventory of destruction, uh, all this sort of poem that is looking at this uh, incredible uh, and awful uh, catastrophe. So again, the interest in words, the interest in labeling, the interest in that sort of charged materiality that I spoke of. Very quickly on to prayer. Um, prayer is a piece that started um, in the late 90s in Cape Town. I was very aware about um, the way apartheid had segregated and separated uh, race and religion and uh, geography and all sorts of things that um, in the only way that I could understand as a sort of a person of privilege. Um, and an initiative that I started was to, in the late 90s, when I was working in an advertising industry, I would, I very much enjoyed the liberty of the internet and the telephone. I started contacting and researching all the different religious groups found in my home city of Cape Town. All forms of Christianity, um, Anglican, 
Catholic, um, LDS, uh, Baptist, everything that I could find. Islam, Judaism, African traditional religion, uh, Baha'i, uh, the Religious Society of Friends, all the different faiths that I could find. I contacted them and asked if it was possible for me to come around when it was uh, when they were free and I could do an audio recording of vocal worship. So prayer, spoken prayer or sung prayer, a nasheed, a nat, a, um, a chant, and to document a piece of vocal worship from all these different uh, faiths. And these were brought together in a multi-channel, a multi-speaker sound installation. So at the same time, you could hear expressions of worship that were not edited. They were just the pieces that I recorded from all the religions that I could contact or all the religions who said yes. Um, the, the installation looks like this. This is a, a red carpet, 60 meters uh, deep, 4 meters wide. There are 12 speakers placed on the carpet. At, at any stage, there is a different selection of prayer coming out of each speaker. So the piece that the the lady is listening to there. That could be the International Society of Krishna Consciousness recorded in Cape Town, followed by a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, followed by a Sufi mosque, followed by a Nishmali mosque, whatever I could find there. So when you enter this installation, all these speakers are playing at the same time. It sounds a little bit like you're entering a very religious cocktail party, lots of speaking happening. You remove your shoes. I like this kind of choreogra choreographic element of it. Um, and also between you and me, it's also because the carpet is a very expensive item on the <laughs> exhibition list and I want to save it. And um, you would, could wander between these speakers listening to all the voices as one kind of avant-garde composition. Or you could, in the choreographic uh, expression of genuflection or supplication, get down on your knees and listen to someone as if you were praying yourself, but you are there listening. And... When you listen to that one speaker, you can hear that speaker very clearly, but you can also hear the other speakers on the periphery. So the one is never taken out of the context of the many. And this was first shown in Cape Town. I'm wrapping this up. Um, first shown in Cape Town, 2000. And then Anna Douglas was the very first person, eight years later, to suggest the possibility of showing it in another city. I'd always thought this was... Me thinking about Cape Town, me thinking about faith there, my autobiographic experience, etc. But thanks to you, it became a technique. Prayer um, was shown in Huddersfield in 2008. It went on to be shown in Nottingham, in Birmingham. And it's uh, now the ninth version. It's just concluded in Stockholm, using all the religions that I could find in Stockholm, a what may well have sort of shaved years of my life, something like 152 recordings, seven and a half hours of footage. You need to take a packed lunch just to get through, sort of through it. But um, the project has grown and grown. And each time because of, of using that city's faith groups, those faith groups want to come and hear themselves. Therefore, they also have to hear each other. So there's an incredible bringing together of people and faiths and a type, a suggestion of fellowship, an opportunity of fellowship. Um, and one of the things yeah. I actually wanted to also say was that the experience of staging that three times is that, um, and this is something that I think is, is quite, uh, an ex the ways of experiencing your work is that it's very non-didactic, it's very spacious. There's actually quite a lot of ambiguity in your work where people actually have to find for themselves how to experience it. Um, and so that actually, the interpretation is not something that is very uh, immediately obvious. You, you discover for yourself the work. I think it's actually a, a, a particular quality of your work that you must discover for yourself what this work means for you at that moment, which one of the things that was so interesting about prayer was how people kept coming back to it. So we actually had a phenomenally high number of both repeat, in a sense, repeats, people coming back and bringing new people. But actually how the moment that they walked into the space, what actually looks extremely simple is kind of is extremely minimalistically elegant. So James is slightly making a, a bit of a joke of the carpet, but when you put down a beautiful quality Axminster carpet, we never put a sign.
saying, you must take your shoes off. But everybody did. There was never any indication of how you should behave with this piece. There were no instructions. Nobody said, take your shoes off, walk onto the carpet, get down on the floor, put your ear down, you'll hear it better. And what was extremely impressive, and I think all the galleries and, and art, because it first went to Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival, it was then performed at the stage at the Ginogli Gallery in Nottingham, and then in fact it was part of Fierce Festival in um, Birmingham. But I think on each occasion, every host has, has commented on a number of things. How long people have stayed with the work has been ex you know, absolutely qualitatively longer than, than normal, whatever that is. Actually, how there's been a huge number of repeat visits, people bringing other people to experience this, and actually then this quality of behaviour. No one tells you how to experience the work, but everybody finds their own balance as to how they want to engage with it. So actually, what was very interesting is that often you would get people who would sit in a group around a speaker, or you would get one person, as James said, in that kind of very interesting symbolic genuflection down to the, down to the, to the speaker itself. Or you would get people, as you can remember, um, wonderful groups of people actually walking around in groups, literally meandering through the speakers as if it was like a landscape of sound. So everybody was finding their own way to actually experience the work. And one of the things I wanted to sort of really introduce now is another reason why um, Wendy and I th thought about you and, the, and, and, and your work in this context was because of your particular interest in sound. And I know you don't want to be known as a sound artist, but it clearly is one of the uh, materials that you work with most often and regularly. And the reason why, um, I and I want to throw this out actually, um, because I know we've slightly already decided that we're going to disagree, um, <laughs> is, 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 I think that might be provocative um, it, and useful, is that one of the reasons why we are, uh, Wendy and I, in thinking about artists, we're, 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 we're commenting on just that this is, apart from <coughs> the fact that this is a place of worship, it is one of the most important collections of post-war art in Britain. I mean, actually, if you don't come here, for any religious reasons. You are certainly coming here for a spiritual encounter with contemporary art post-war, and that will take you into some spiritual or some kind of realm, which is very different than the one outside in the street in your daily life. And this place is just full of the most important post-war artists that you could have possibly brought them together. And this was Basil Spence really working here hard to bring Actually, a lot of artists are very interesting, and I think it's a question we may go on to, which is not all the artists that were commissioned here by any means would have thought themselves as religious people. But actually, Spence recognised that they could do something in this space that would create a certain kind of experience for those people who were coming here, both for uh, you know, a, a kind of devotional reasons, but actually also would create a very particular and unique and and special quality for those to just come to be in a space which was not like any other kind of public or private space anywhere else. They would come here to seek solace and interest and engagement and a sense of relation with something other than themselves through the art. But because this building is full of the most extraordinary John Piper windows, and Elizabeth Fink sculptures, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the rest, and one could go on and on, <laughs> um, we thought, well, what else can you put in here that isn't going to be dwarfed by the magnificence of what is already here? I mean, architecturally, you've got a magnificent building, and then you've got all this sculpture and tapestry, the largest tapestry in the world, and these fabulous stained glass windows. What can you put in here that isn't going to be utterly dwarfed by this magnificence? And we thought, well, actually, there's no sound art here, is there? Basil Spence didn't commission any sound art. Good cathedral, always conceived of the cathedral, actually as a place for music. But this concept of sound art wasn't even invented then. So we're ahead here. We're going to do, we're going to commission artists where there's no track record of this. Sound or moving image. So actually I said, this is one of the reasons why we chose you, because you were a sound artist, and you and we said, you know, I said, you know, because the place is full of visual, kind of full of visuality, and what could you possibly do to compete with that? To which you said, yes, but don't think there's no sound here already. Yes, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> and, and also my, my feeling with responding to a space is, I, I think it's a bit odd to be said, oh, you need to make something visual or something sonic or, or something like that. That that's. There is sound here, and also thinking of the use of the space. 
there, to, to play sound in a space like this is complicated and it's um, people are coming here either to to listen to a sermon or to find quiet or to listen to the cathedral even song and, th and things like that to add sound to that I, I think this Spence I think no doubt well, I'm sure he would say this anticipated <laughs> sonic art um, but certainly I don't I can't imagine he wanted any more so-called visual art in that space and therefore I think something conceptual that we can work around what is already there and this is a question that I had to ask when I came here was when looking at the space and feeling the space and listening to the space is what is here and there is so much here uh, and that is from the stories to the to a route you can take to the choreography that if you walk from the ruins of St. Michael's into the cathedral and this is something John showed me on my very first day here and if you had to walk up to the, uh, the Sutherland Tapestry and you had to get Holy Communion when you turn round then you see the stained glass kicking into doing what it's supposed to do and everything is illuminated and you get the red in the stained glass on a Sunday morning all these colors, all the symbolism just starts popping out. You can also look back uh, through the glass onto the ruins, and it's as if you've gone through this almost a veil between these two worlds. That there's a, it is incredibly clever, and the choreography, the, there's so much meaning. This, and this is why it's so exciting and daunting to work in a space like this, is that everything already has meaning. So the question I had to l look for is what is here? And obviously there is an enormous amount of visuality and there's very particular sonic elements, including a very powerful organ. Mm -hmm. But there's also so much meaning and, and there's choreography. So it's how, and this is a question I can't necessarily answer <laughs> right now for you this evening, is like how does one work with all what is there? And Can I just ask you about silence then? Because I think this is one of the things that was very interesting is that you reminded me that actually there is silence here. There's quiet. And there, there's quiet. Yes. And I wondered whether you could just perhaps say a little bit about finding that, that quality of the building. That that, that is one of the things that requ is required to be preserved here too, is that actually some people are coming here to be quiet. Absolutely. And I, I think that when I arrived here and I was almost auditioning ideas or existing projects in the space in my mind I, and having tried to work publicly in not out of the white cube even just working with sound in the white cube um, is an issue because you sound moves sound doesn't ask permission sound <laughs> bleeds and uh, goes through walls we can't stop it we can't close our ears so if you're on a group show with me and I've got a sound work, well, we're going to have to promise to be friends after <laughs> we have the big debate on turning it down and, and things like that, that I was already nervous about interrupting the space and rather, um, and I was also very inspired by that quiet. I, I, this, to walk around and to find both moments of, of peace visually and sonically and choreographically where there's a space to sit, there's a space to think. Um, so I think that's that kind of an interesting challenge is that for, for somebody who does work so often with sound, where you put a sound into a space that doesn't belong there, to actually recognise that that might be problematic in a place where the silence is not an absence of nothing. It's yes. just a nothing sound. But even if you put something, a sound in there that belongs there, there's possibly a reason why it won't work there as well um, that there's a there's certain times where something would be appropriate I'm, I'm also very conscious as to who the for want of another word to use a, a theatre a word connected to theatre and a word connected to art who the audience is this and it's a very odd thing to say in the cathedral the audience but um, who will be using the piece who will be experiencing the piece is that this is not always an opportunity to make something that um, is going to either affirm or shock 
so these are the kind of questions that I think have to be thought through, especially not only working in a public space. When you think of a public space, you might think of a, a town square or something like that where someone could move on from, from the piece. When you're working in something like a cathedral, all of these questions become harder. So actually, on, on that note, that all of these questions become harder. I, I wondered whether you could just give us a flavour, really, of... We, J James has just come back this week, actually, and on Monday um, sat with, with myself and John and, and Asher and various people, Wendy and, and Sam at the cathedral, and really, for the first time, actually helped us begin to follow what he's been following in terms of ideas. And so I just wondered whether you could perhaps give us some flavour of what kind of things have been preoccupying while you, this is your second visit, so yes. what sort of things have been preoccupying? So this, I'm, I've just got a few images that have kind of caught my attention and my uh, imagination a little bit as I've been here. Um, and thanks to Paul and thanks to Diane and to John with the tours I've had here and the kind of information you've shared. Um, as well as being here and being influenced, absorbing the symbolism of the cathedral, things have just been sort of popping up in my head. For example, Diane, in the archives, in your office, I saw this image, well, it looks a bit sharp on my computer, but uh, what do you call that? The ring, ring road. Ring yeah. road. When I saw the ring road, this photostatic image of the ring road, the first thing that came to my head was a crown of thorns. That already, and I, just by being spending space, that one of the advantages of being in residence uh, is that you start, I think, trying to see through, looking at that space with new, new eyes, that time and space is an incredible gift uh, to an artist working. Um, and it sort of affects your eyes. So when I saw that, I thought this was almost an interesting image that maybe by being in the cathedral, I'm starting to see sort of kind of maps as being spiritual in, in, in some circumstance. I was deeply affected by the image and the story of the broadcast on Chris, Christmas Day in 1940, where six weeks after St. Michael's was, for all intents and purposes, and parts of Coventry obliterated, there was this incredible moment where reconciliation was articulated through radio. And radio is such a fascinating and amazing uh, medium, because two years before, I think for me one of uh, the most important uh, radio sound pieces of the last century occurred in, uh, in New York when Orson Welles presented The War of the Worlds on the 30th of October 1938, where he took H.G. Wells' novel about Martians invading London, he set it in New York, and on radio presented it as if it was a news broadcast. If you tuned in five minutes late, not knowing that this was Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air, you'd be forgiven, along with a lot of Americans who were there, for thinking this was real, this was happening, and Martians were in fact invading Earth. And it sent people panicking. When it sent people panicking. People were putting wet towels on their heads. Not sure why, but they were running out, going to the police. The, the, the police were called in when um, people would see the police coming out uh, in their squad cars to try and uh, calm the people panicking. They thought, oh, that's the police coming to help us from the aliens. So. This I mentioned just as the power of radio to, to reach out to, and this is just a quick mention in terms of World War II, two is that um, Orson Welles' piece was heard by the Nazis. Hitler spoke of it saying this is an example of the kind of stupidity of um, the American allies. And so the, the thought of radio as this ubiquitous force this, um, this kind of cloud that people can tune into, um, that people in Germany would have heard Provost Howard's speech on the BBC on Christmas Day, 1940. And this calling for reconciliation, that really, um, <coughs> that really affected me. I thought this was an incredible moment. Also, the other artistic interventions that occurred around the bombing when the um, 
gentleman on the, the, the day after the bombing went up to the spire and noticed two um, would be beams, ceiling beams, uh, that had fallen into the shape of a cross, these charred beams, and that's the charred cross that you will see uh, in this building. That was an amazing kind of artistic way of looking at an object. Um, similarly, the cross of nails. These sort of symbols, along with the radio broadcast, I think are so powerful in terms of the history of this cathedral and this city and the way we kind of can sort of think about that is a, that is the, the post-war art that sort of, that, that, that's come out of that, that moment. So this was a, a major inspiration for me. Um, seeing the symbols that you can notice uh, in objects, what someone might think means one thing, has got a different history with, with someone else. Uh, speaking about the sun wheel image um, that is over there, this obviously caught my attention. This, I thought, was in a really incredible uh, moment, the unknown civilians killed in war, um, a moment just to consider the people whose names we don't know. Um, this felt, uh, and there's a, an image later that, that I'd like to show that this connected um, uh, was for me. Uh, this was extremely moving, I think a really powerful um, piece. The coins on the floor, and correct me if I'm wrong, are these used in a kind of choreographic way to guide? Yeah, to guide the choruses. Yes, to, to guide choruses as they, they enter, I thought was really incredible. So this um, thought of this coin could have this use place that people could think of, they could connect to, they could guide them as you're walking um, through the cathedral. I, I mentioned the, I'm sorry about this image, but the, the choreography of looking back at the cathedral through this uh, almost like a veil, some kind of spiritual veil between the, um, the past and the present. That was extremely powerful for me. Again, the stained glass that you can see when you have sort of been at the altar and you turn around. It's an incredible moment that you heading in, I think, awed by the tapestry. Um, but then there's also this moment as you turn around and you are, something is there's a new message there, and I think this is really incredible where, um, where art and culture and our symbols can be there to, um, to make us think, to give us these moments to interpret. Um, the, the bell, I think also, it, again, the sort of connection of German, uh, Germany with World War II, the, um, the theme of peace, reconciliation, the, 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 the languages, the English and German, that, um, that certainly made a lot of sense to me. In South Africa, we have 11 official languages, and uh, I think we should be using them a lot more. Um, I was also very intrigued by the kind of community of the, um, what, what's the official term for? Needle workers. Needle workers. I think I was grasping for that, but I thought it was wrong. <laughs> and um, just the, the other kind of the, the visuality that is connected to this cathedral that is there, the, the symbols, the the vestments, the stoles that are, are really powerful. They're part of the kind of iconic language of this cathedral, that there's so much here that has been, that is used and um, connected with and, and thought of, that it's an interesting challenge for an artist, not myself, but all of us to consider what, what new things can come in here, what, um, what can work, because there really is such a powerful language. How can we work with that? I don't necessarily have answers to that right now. Um, also, another um, connection, I, I didn't know the exact site of this, but the amazing story about 1968, there was a sculpture exhibition in the ruins of St. Michael's, and it included a late entry, as far as I understand, from one John Lennon and Yoko Ono, who had a piece that they installed, which was effectively two acorns, and, and a circular white bench that was on top of this, these buried acorns that one day perhaps two oak trees would grow and they could grow in, in between this, the, 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 the center of the circular bench and people could sit under this bench uh, and be shaded or protected from the elements and think about well, certainly the peace initiatives that Yoko and John were working on at that time and subsequently which certainly connected into the 
uh, all the work that the cathedral did. This has got a very interesting story because, uh, as far as I understand, the acorns were stolen, Paul, no? which... Well, uh, not the squirrels, but... Possibly yeah. squirrels, uh, <laughs> or Beatles fans, or squirrels who happen to be Beatles fans, or something like that. And um, I think there are a couple of stories, but the um, John Lennon was not impressed with this. I think also the site of the installation had to be moved. Um, the, I think it was organized by Canon, Canon Stephen Verney, was the, the person who put the, put the exhibition together. Lennon was not impressed. Um, the acorns had gone missing, and he sent his chauffeur to go and collect this circular white bench, which I looked for it. I was told that it could be seen in the video to imagine. I don't know, because I looked on YouTube, and it was all so blurry, and me squinting into YouTube. It may or no, may not be in the YouTube uh, video of Imagine. But it's an amazing story, and Yoko Ono returned to the cathedral, I think in 2013, and there were two trees that were sort of dedicated from her. But the fact that you've got this connection to contemporary art of artists working here, I think is extremely, extremely exciting. And it connects to other things I'll mention later. Um, we'll jump over the David Ward. The only thing I want to say is it's a sound installation that is here in Coventry, but it's not working. And I want to try and contact David Ward and see if he can help get this working again. And that was just an image, I thought, of an incidental sculpture, an imprint of a shoe somewhere in the environment. I can't re remember where I took the photograph, but um, I'll leave it there. But these, one of the things that you've mentioned a number of times in our conversation is, is the idea of storying. Yes. Experience being storied. And I wondered where, where this idea is taking you in relation to where you're going currently with your thinking about what we're working towards, which yes. is the realization of a new commission in 2018, which is the, John, help me here, the diocese is vice uh, centenary. 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 The diocese is 100, diocese is 100 years 100 old. Years. So, so this is, so, so without, without holding you to what is it yes. you're going to make in 2018? Sure. Of all of, the, of all of the research that you've done here and, your, and the experiences, and I think that's the other thing that comes across very much when you're talking is about that you've created sculptures and you've created actually performance events and you've created what might be called uh, happenings. One of the things that keeps kind of coming back is the feeling that what you're interested in is experience, is actually the idea of somebody, somebody having an experience because of an encounter with something that you've put in a place that wouldn't normally be there. Yes. And then you stand back. You don't totally close down the experience. It has elements, actually, of the ritualistic, which is something that you find here in this building and actually has, uh, is, is, is a quality that you've been interested in in other works, actually, where something becomes ritualistic because of its repetition. But actually, then you stand back, and in a way, you allow the, the visitor, audience, user to create the ritualistic engagement with whatever it is you've put in that place for themselves. And, I, and you've talked very much about actually your own emotion actually being in this place, and actually just generally, in fact, about your encounter with, with places where you're commissioned to do work, that actually you're also coming with um, a kind of uh, that background of being uh, anthropologically interested in religions, actually having worked in advertising where your focus has been about effective communication, where ambiguity is less what you want, in fact. You're wanting much more to get a message across yes. which is less ambiguous. So that's taught you something about actually how to be ambiguous by effectively working in a non-ambiguous context. But actually also what you're interested in is, is that idea of actually creating a space for something to happen, creating enough guidelines to think what might, but actually not being so overly confident that's the only thing can happen, and then standing, standing back and letting something happen. If I'm right in that sort of summary, can you, can you give us a sense of where you might be going with what it is that you are currently creatively playing with? And I think that's something that we actually also want to emphasize at this point, is that James, in a way, is playing and experimenting and feeling ideas rather than at this point saying, and this is what it's going to look like, or this is what it's going to sound like, and this is what you're going to do next year. So I just wondered whether you could... Sure. Well, I think all the things you said are, all sound fantastic, and they're very nice to look at with hindsight. Like, yes, that project did fulfill those things. Um, 
and they are on my mind. I, I suppose I, the, in looking at what is here, I also need to ask what is not here. And this story of Provost Howard and that radio broadcast, I think is something that is here but not here. That um, the radio broadcast, I think it probably would have been about 15 minutes, it went out on BBC Christmas Day, 1940. And the BBC made an edited version, which I think was released on a 78, possibly in the 70s. You might have to explain what a 78 is, because it's a lot I'm not 100% sure myself, myself having been born in 75. But it's a small disc. Um, it's quite a big disc. Yeah. Yeah. Big a really disc. heavy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're quite big, I'm having very so, well, and I'm an older person than you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't look at it. Yeah. <laughs> So this BBC would have um, released possibly a limited edition of 78s uh, of, um, of discs that put an edited version of the Provost Howard speech, uh, made it available. These are nowhere to be found. Um, Diane Morris says she has fielded calls from people looking for this. Um, we can't find this. There is a small MP3 or wave copy of the of the speech and what I'm thinking about is that it would be really interesting to return that iconic speech that was presented on radio is to return it to radio to return it to the electromagnetic realm to the ether that it could be there like a kind of uh, a repeated ritual in some way so this is a kind of an experiment with it. Um, here we've got a radio. Um, uh, the is playing not only of the fascists, but also of the terrorists, because... I hear it. So this, this thought that it is... Actually, can we just explain what happened there? Because for people who are just so... You, no. Okay, no. you are going to explain. Oh, um, uh, the, um, this is using a small radio transmitter and rebroadcasting that sound back into the airwaves. And, um, and so it's here to... It's currently around us in so the way that live. radio... It's not pre-recorded and yes. just been played yeah. off a CD. Um, this is actually live now in this room. That it's, it's there. And, and thinking about radio and thinking about the power of radio and the, the nature of the medium, um, that it could, it is currently in our environs. It's, um, it's a presence. It's an invisible presence that is around us that uh, we can connect to. And uh, it can be there, even as a sort of a, if I dare I say, a kind of a hyper-conceptual work um, that message sort of remains in, in this space. So that, I think, is the beginning of something. And um, the, when discussion about thoughts on how this could be updated, could be made contemporary, how we could potentially make a new version of this, um, include the old version, how to return to that moment along with the charged materiality in the cross of nails and the... Um, Cross um, that they, we could. It's the radio again. <laughs> um, those three iconic things can return to the space and be be there together. So that's that's kind of where the mind is at the moment. I just wanted to before we because we wanted to just have, give some time for people to ask questions as well. I just wanted to really bring our part of our conversation to, to, to some kind of closure by saying, picking up on something you said about being affected by being here. Yes. So things that you actually have known outside of being here, before you came here, yes. have taken on new meaning whilst being here, because yes. of being here. Things that you've read, things that you've been thinking about. Actually, you've brought from outside, or being here, and the presence of being here has brought to your mind things from elsewhere. And I wonder, that, that makes me think about 
actually a, a broader question that, that Wendy and I started with a year ago. Why bring a contemporary artist into <coughs> a space like this? What can a contemporary artist, who is not as in previous commissions, often in religious um, buildings and spaces, um, an artist would be identifying themselves as specifically religious and would see actually the making of the work in a, in a religious building as being their own act of devotion. They would be commissioned as known religious people to make artwork that they saw themselves as part of their devotion to God. But actually in bringing a contemporary artist into a space like this who isn't professing to be religious and isn't professing to make a work which is about a devotion to God, I just wanted in a more general way, not necessarily speaking particularly about your experience, but actually what role you think contemporary artists have today. Because one of the things that one could talk about as being in crisis is, is contemporary commissioning for religious spaces. Actually, where are the contemporary artists who want to work in all kinds of, many kinds of religious spaces, um, who would see that now as a brief that they would want? And, and actually, who would you go to? Um, and I think this possibly has led to a bit of a crisis since the 1960s in contemporary art commissioning. And certainly, if you go to churches built just after the war, you'll see this incredible flourishing, actually, of commissioning artists, not just who profess to be religious, but just artists in general, to be part of creating spaces of spiritual encounter. And then by the time you get to the 70s and 80s, there's no more commissioning. The commissioning, because there's, there's very little in religious buildings actually being, being commissioned. So actually, live commissioning is over, and you're either experiencing historical work, or there's nothing. And so actually, one could say there's almost a bit of a crisis in the idea of commissioning for a religious or for sacred spaces, using that in a broader sense. And perhaps we haven't used that word sacred yet. And so I just wondered whether you might like to respond to just your feelings about what is the role of a contemporary artist in a sacred space. And perhaps to add to that question, do you think it's their role to make sacred the space? I think if I could start with your second question first. I think that the sacred space would interpret whatever you place in there through um, a sacred lens. I'm interested when people speak of site specificity, the way I think in the past many people have imagined that the artwork transforms the site. But I'm thinking more and more the way that particularly when you work here, or in the case of Tracy M in, in Liverpool, the site transforms the artwork. And that's where you can take an artist that has been as, um, that is as contemporary and occasionally as controversial as Tracy Emin, and have a piece that in this situation can only be read in a spiritual way. Well, it can't only be read, but there's a, it opens up so many things. And I think it's very interesting when an artist uh, has the opportunity to work in a space that is not the market and is not the white cube and the way a, a public space doesn't just have to be when people speak of public art they think of something outdoors um, it could be a, another form of um, public space a church a library a train station or something like that and I would like to think an artist can bring a new um, experience, a new way of seeing, and not just a visual seeing, but a new way of kind of experiencing that space in some way. Um, there's another example that I, I found um, at Documenta this year, um, the American artist um, Olu uh, Ogube, his work, you can't see this, I'm so sorry. Um, this is a a kind of concrete obelisk-like needle that was placed in the middle of um, the town of Kassel for Documenta. And what you can't read is a quote from Matthew 25, verse 35, um, which I've got here in German, uh, which says, I was a stranger, and then you took me in. And this is in German, English, Arabic, and I think... Greek. Um, and this piece is a work by a contemporary artist placed using a spiritual reference, but placed in a situation where it can 
speak to visitors, to refugees, to strangers. The piece, in fact, is called Monument for Strangers and Refugees. And I think, uh, which is sort of another element of your, or sort of an addition to your question, is where can spirituality also speak to people that might not be um, necessarily think of themselves as religious? Or spiritual. Or spiritual, absolutely. Um, so this is a piece I wanted to sort of bring that I think uh, is incredibly elegant and very beautiful, and it connected in some way for me to the um, very beautiful memorial here to the unknown civilians, um, which is outside. The, these two, I think it's the use of text, also with the kind of concrete or the stone that, uh, that connected. There was another piece in Documenta that I think also references um, there. I was a stranger and you took me in. There's the English and the Arabic. Really beautiful, powerful piece. Um, a piece by Daniel Knorr, um, which was in Documented, was this permanent cloud of white uh, smoke that billowed from one of the windows of, above one of the main museums there, which kind of made me think of uh, sort of Catholicism and uh, kind of an uh, election of a pope or something like that. But um, there was something, um, I think, knowing that and to be able to interpret this space and that work through a spiritual lens, I think, was quite interesting. Apart from also thinking, oh no, something might well be on fire. <laughs> um, Should we open it just uh, take a few minutes to sure. see if anybody. I mean, one of the other comments that I, I was really referring to, um, my experience actually going to the Venice Biennale this year was actually, if anybody else was there, that actually in the Arsenale, where, which is the, 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 the big kind of curated space, which this year was curated around the idea of pavilions, and one of the pavilions was indeed to shamanism and spirituality. And, and I think one of the things that's um, interesting is that spirituality seems to be back on the spoken agenda in relation to contemporary art, whereas for many, many years it's been absolutely not. It has been really a place that you know, contemporary art doesn't want to go, where people might talk about art as being and their encounter and engagement with art almost as a substitute for religion, and many people do talk about it as being the place they go to for the, the secular solace that they would have got or secular engagement with a kind of spiritual other that they would have once perhaps sought for in religion. Actually, this concept of art as providing that space has really become quite unfashionable, and actually certainly if one was to look at what an international curator has offered through the Arsenale, the Venice Biennale this year, it suggests that for many, it is back on back on the table to be able to talk about, rather unashamedly. Um, but I just wondered whether that was just kind of my comment actually to to, to James with anyone today. And I just wondered whether we, if we take just a few questions. Point. And it made me think of Jeremy Deller's piece uh, last year, which was a uh, name I can't remember. Um, was people dressed as soldiers from the First World War? Mm. That was sort of in and around different cities. And I think it's very interesting to also think about contemporary memorials to war. Um, and that, yeah, yes, I mean, I, I think certainly the conversations that you've been having, both with John and other people here, and, and yourself, have been very much about, actually, what does this cathedral represent in relation to questions of war, not just in relation to questions around faith. And also, well, how can we think about the historical narratives in a contemporary way? And I think that also, uh, connects to the proposed memorial to the people who died in the that massacre in Norway, uh, I think f mm. six years ago, and an artist mm. suggested sort of a, a cut in this island, uh, and this piece was rejected, but it seemed to be a very interesting, very powerful um, new version of what a memorial could be. There, has, there have been some conversations about what the old ruins might stand for, and from time to time the conversation has been about whether they be expressly dedicated as a memorial to civilians killed in war. I confess I'm fiercely resistant to such a concept, because I think that the ruins speak in such a deep-rooted way to our experience of brokenness of all sorts that I feel quite resistant to restricting an interpretation in that way. So I'm sure that for some people they will directly speak into that particular narrative, but I, I don't want to, them to speak, um, to be limited to that. And that thing ties very closely into what you've just said and actually raises the question about how other war memorials might in a sense receive a fresh interpretation in t that relates to other forms of brokenness for people who perhaps wouldn't particularly connect with the original meaning, mm -hmm. which I think is quite an interesting idea actually.
I think that that's something we almost need to, as soon as the piece is more defined, uh, then it would be amazing to invite collaborators and uh, people that can work together on on a piece like this. At the moment, everything is sort of still being discussed, um, but it's really a wonderful thing to know that people would be able to help. Thank you. I mean, I think I think actually one of the things that we we will be looking to try and um, bring together um, as as James sort of leaves. Uh, Coventry this the end of this week is to really move forward with with one or two project ideas and at that point actually start to talk to people about how they might be able to contribute to, to developing them so um, so that is absolutely we will hold you absolutely to your tweeting off believe me so in a sense you're putting the emphasis more on s back it, to really what James is about back to the, the, event, yeah, to the story about to the story the event, yeah. The yeah. so the in a sense you're looking at the story again. Yeah. and be the memorial yeah. Christian because the memorial Tansky. could hide and bury the yeah. reality. I mean, I think this is one of, one of the great contributions that contemporary art has been making, hasn't it, for, mm. for, for quite a number of years now. It really is to, is to challenge this, the, the, the kind of edifice memorial, yeah. the fixed memorial, and actually move much more into a process of storying, narrativizing, performing. So that actually, and also, and also to recognize durational time yeah. as being the memorial, not necessarily something that's kind of, in, in a sense, fixed. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of both, both um, artistic practice that's working against those ideas, as well as kind of theoretical interrogation against the memorial. I mean, I think there's even a book titled Against the Memorial. Um, before we kind of bring, bring the evening to a close, actually, is well, there anybody who wants to respond quickly to yes. that? Christian Boltanski is a piece, I think, of the recent Folkestone Triennale, which was letters read from servicemen. Uh, which it's a similar area to what you're proposing. And I think one of the things actually um, I've been overhearing in conversations actually between John and James is actually, and I think James, one of the, one might even call it a byproduct of James's, James's presence here, is to enable certain conversations to take place, regardless of what the work might be in 2018. Actually, James's presence here um, is that certain conversations have been had that might not have been had. So one of, the quote, one of the conversations that I certainly overheard very recently this week was, what is the function of a cathedral in relation to questions of peace and reconciliation? I mean, that's a really big question. But it was a conversation that started to happen on Monday morning. And actually, in many ways, um, I think one of the things that, uh, as you move around the place, having conversations with Paul and Diane and John, actually conversations and there are ideas in those conversations which will live on beyond you having them. Rather like the way you're talking about the radio, the conversations that you've been having, they live on in those people and they will then live on with others. And those conversations themselves will generate further conversations and further ideas around this big question of what is a cathedral to do? What is a cathedral to do in a city like Coventry post-war? What is its job? What is its function? What is it to do? But actually going back to then that personal question is that's, that's, a, big, that's a big edifice kind of question. That's John's job. <laughs> but so it actually goes down for you if to I can, the If I can just it? comment really briefly on that. So there's been a bit of a conversation about spirituality, whether spirituality is in a mode word or not a mode word. Uh, spirituality is not, as it happens to be about religion for people who are religious. But as I'm sure you all know, everybody has a spirituality. Um, spirituality is simply our approach to questions like, who am I, why am I, what am I for, um, what am I doing here? Uh, those, are, those are the questions of spirituality. And the point of this sort of exercise is to use this space to bring people to reflect those questions back to an individual so that the, one's hope is, my hope as a, as a priest, and your hope, I dare say, as an artist, um, is that, that actually this will lead us in those kind of reflections, um, both individually and corporately, and that's really mm. what we're about mm. here. And that is, for me, is spirituality. Mm. And that's a really, I think, a, unless anybody else has got a question. I think in the beginning it was a big challenge uh, in terms of how to approach someone to explain the idea, and that it could be... Uh, misinterpreted as someone who wanted to kind of appropriate something or uh, put things into uh, 
untoward contexts and things like that. So I think the challenge was trying to distill what I wanted to do and make it uh, make the invitation to the people I was uh, inviting to participate as clear as possible. And I think to try and be quite um, as open as possible and as vigilant as possible to getting to communicating with people and it's gotten easier but I've done nine versions um, so I think that communication has gotten a bit uh, a, a bit easier over time but I'm, the next version is in Chicago for next September and no doubt there'll be challenges that I haven't anticipated yet so I'll let you know when I see you next <laughs> Um, so actually, I, I, I just kind of want to take us back to really John's, John's point, because I think um, really about actually what, what, what I'm, I'm listening to is a very fruitful dialogue between you two, where you actually connect exactly with the point that you've just been making, really, which is actually what you're both seeking to do in relation to actually those big questions about how do I experience myself in the world. And, and I think that actually really in relation to all of your works, that is, that is one, one could say the predominant question. How do I experience myself in this moment, in presence, to this work? And what does being in presence to this work actually allow me to experience of myself? And I just think that we look forward to actually what that experience might be next year in 2018 and seeing how we might find ourselves in presence with your work in a place and who knows we don't know yet and that's what's exciting about commissioning a new artist to produce a piece of work we don't know yet and that's what's frightening for the artist being commissioned <laughs> he's not 100% sure he knows yet either but can i just draw together thank you very much thank you, thank you.